Lesson 7 Worship and Education Sabbath Afternoon November 7 When you come together for worship and to seek the Lord, it should be your one aim to honor Him whose requirements are all equal and just. His will, declared to you in His Word, is to be carried out to the letter. The rule of righteousness revealed in the lives of His professing people is to make them conspicuous. We are to live with an eye single to the glory of God, ever seeking to be Christians in every sense of the Word. Commune often every day with your God, and listen to the voice that says to you, Be still and know that I am God. Psalm 46.10 As your responsibilities increase with the advancement of the message, temptations will also increase. As the magnitude of the work presses itself upon the soul, humble your hearts before God. Act faithfully your part in the work, and stand faithfully in your individual accountability before God. God is no respecter of persons. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. This Day with God, page 78. No words can properly set forth the deep blessedness of genuine worship. When human beings sing with the spirit and the understanding, heavenly musicians take up the strain and join in the song of thanksgiving. He who has bestowed upon us all the gifts that enable us to be workers together with God expects his servants to cultivate their voices so that they can speak and sing in a way that all can understand. It is not loud singing that is needed, but clear intonation, correct pronunciation, and distinct utterance. Let all take time to cultivate the voice so that God's praise can be sung in clear, soft tones not with harshness and shrillness that offend the ear. The ability to sing is the gift of God. Let it be used to His glory. In the meetings held, let a number be chosen to take part in the song service, and let the singing be accompanied with musical instruments skillfully handled. We are not to oppose the use of instrumental music in our work. This part of the service is to be carefully conducted, for it is the praise of God in song. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9, pages 143 and 144. In the minds of many, there are no more sacred thoughts connected with the house of God than with the most commonplace. Some will enter the place of worship in soiled, dirty clothes. Such do not realize that they are to meet with God and holy angels. There should be a radical change in this matter all through our churches because of the irreverence in attitude, dress, and deportment, and a lack of a worshipful frame of mind, God has often turned His face away from those assembled for His worship. God is to be the subject of thought, the object of worship, and anything that attracts the mind from the solemn sacred service is an offense to Him. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, pages 498 and 499. Sunday, November 8. We all worship something. To bow down when in prayer to God is the proper attitude to occupy. This act of worship was required of the three Hebrew captives in Babylon, but such an act was homage to be rendered to God alone, the sovereign of the world, the ruler of the universe and these three Hebrews refused to give such honor to any idol, even though composed of pure gold. In doing so, they would, to all intents and purposes, be bowing to the king of Babylon. Refusing to do as the king had commanded, they suffered the penalty and were cast into the burning fiery furnace. But Christ came in person and walked with them through the fire, and they received no harm. Both in public and private worship, it is our duty to bow down upon our knees before God when we offer our petitions to Him. This act shows our dependence upon God. Selected Messages, Book 2, page 312 The three Hebrews were called upon to confess Christ in the face of the burning fiery furnace. They had been commanded by the king to fall down and worship the golden image which he had set up, and threatened that if they would not, 
they should be cast alive into the fiery furnace. But they answered, We are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Daniel chapter 3, verses 16 to 18. It cost them something to confess Christ, for their lives were at stake. If you are called to go through the fiery furnace for Christ's sake, Jesus will be at your side. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2. Our High Calling, page 358. The importance of the Sabbath as the memorial of creation is that it keeps ever present the true reason why worship is due to God, because He is the Creator and we are His creatures. The Sabbath therefore lies at the very foundation of divine worship, for it teaches this great truth in the most impressive manner and no other institution does this. The true ground of divine worship, not of that on the seventh day merely, but of all worship, is found in the distinction between the Creator and His creatures. This great fact can never become obsolete and must never be forgotten. Jan Andrews, History of the Sabbath, Chapter 27 It was to keep this truth ever before the minds of men that God instituted the Sabbath in Eden, and so long as the fact that He is our Creator continues to be a reason why we should worship Him, so long the Sabbath will continue as its sign and memorial. The Great Controversy, pages 437 and 438. Monday, November 9. And declare them to their children. Parents, Elevate the standard of Christianity in the minds of your children. Help them to weave Jesus into their experience. Teach them to have the highest reverence for the house of God and to understand that when they enter the Lord's house, it should be with hearts that are softened and subdued by such thoughts as these. God is here. This is His house. I must have pure thoughts and the holiest motives. I must have no pride, envy, jealousy, evil surmising, hatred, or deception in my heart, for I am coming into the presence of the Holy God. This is the place where God meets with and blesses His people. The High and Holy One who inhabiteth eternity looks upon me, searches my heart, and reads the most secret thoughts and acts of my life. Will you not devote a little thought to this subject and notice how you conduct yourselves in the house of God and what efforts you are making by precept and example to cultivate reverence in your children? You roll vast responsibilities upon the preacher and hold him accountable for the souls of your children, but you do not sense your own responsibility as parents and as instructors and, like Abraham, command your household after you that they may keep the statutes of the Lord. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 494. Our Savior did not encourage any to attend the rabbinical schools of His day for the reason that their minds would be corrupted with the continually repeated, they say, or it has been said. Why then should we accept the unstable words of men as exalted wisdom when a greater, a certain wisdom is at our command? That which I have seen of eternal things and that which I have seen of the weakness of humanity has deeply impressed my mind and influenced my life work. I see nothing wherein man should be praised or glorified. I see no reason why the opinions of worldly wise men and so-called great men should be trusted in and exalted. How can those who are destitute of divine enlightenment have correct ideas of God's plans and ways? They either deny Him altogether and ignore His existence, or they circumscribe His power by their own finite conceptions. Let us choose to be taught by Him who created the heavens and the earth, by Him who set the stars in their order in the firmament and appointed the sun and the moon to do their work. 
it is right for the youth to feel that they must reach the highest development of their mental powers. We would not restrict the education to which God has set no limit. But our attainments avail nothing if not put to use for the honor of God and the good of humanity. The Ministry of Healing, page 449. Tuesday, November 10. In Spirit and in Truth. Jesus desired to lift the thoughts of his hearer above matters of form and ceremony and questions of controversy. The hour cometh, he said, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. As the woman talked with Jesus, she was impressed with his words. Never had she heard such sentiments from the priests of her own people or from the Jews. As the past of her life had been spread out before her, she had been made sensible of her great want. She realized her soul thirst, which the waters of the well of Sychar could never satisfy. Nothing that had hitherto come in contact with her had so awakened her to a higher need. Jesus had convinced her that he read the secrets of her life, yet she felt that he was her friend, pitying and loving her. While the very purity of his presence condemned her sin, he had spoken no word of denunciation, but had told her of his grace that could renew the soul. As the woman heard these words, faith sprang up in her heart. She accepted the wonderful announcement from the lips of the divine teacher. The Desire of Ages, pages 189 and 190. Christ's message to the Samaritan woman with whom he had talked at Jacob's well had borne fruit. After listening to his words, the woman had gone to the men of the city, saying, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? They went with her, heard Jesus, and believed on him. Anxious to hear more, they begged him to remain. For two days he stayed with them, and many more believed because of his own word. John chapter 4, verses 29 and 41. And when his disciples were driven from Jerusalem, some found in Samaria a safe asylum. The Samaritans welcomed these messengers of the gospel, and the Jewish converts gathered a precious harvest from among those who had once been their bitterest enemies. The Acts of the Apostles, page 106. God's servants are to stand as minutemen, ready for service at a moment's notice. My brethren, from hour to hour, opportunities to serve God will open before you. These constantly come and go. Be ever ready to make the most of them. That chance to speak in the hearing of some needy soul, the word of life, may never again offer itself. Therefore let no one venture to say, I pray thee have me excused. Lose no opportunity to make known to others the unsearchable riches of Christ, for an opportunity once neglected may pass forever beyond recall. Gospel Workers, page 195 Wednesday, November 11 The Beauty of Holiness When the Holy Spirit moves upon human minds, all petty complaints and accusations between man and his fellow man will be put away. The bright beams of the Son of Righteousness will shine into the chambers of the mind and heart. In our worship of God, there will be no distinction between rich and poor, white and black. All prejudice will be melted away. When we approach God, it will be as one brotherhood. We are pilgrims and strangers, bound for a better country, even a heavenly. There all pride, all accusation, all self-deception will forever have an end. Every mask will be laid aside, and we shall see him as he is. Our house of worship may be very humble, but it is nonetheless acknowledged by God. If we worship in spirit and in truth, and in the beauty of holiness, it will be to us the very gate of heaven. As lessons of the wondrous works of God are repeated, and as the heart's gratitude is expressed in prayer and song, angels from heaven take up the strain and unite in praise and thanksgiving to God. These exercises drive back the power of Satan. They expel murmurings and complainings, and Satan loses ground. 
in Heavenly Places, page 288. Although God dwells not in temples made with hands, yet He honors with His presence the assemblies of His people. He has promised that when they come together to seek Him, to acknowledge their sins, and to pray for one another, He will meet with them by His Spirit. But those who assemble to worship Him should put away every evil thing. Unless they worship Him in spirit and truth, and in the beauty of holiness, their coming together will be of no avail. Of such the Lord declares, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Matthew chapter 15 verses 8 and 9. Those who worship God must worship Him in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship Him. John chapter 4 verse 23. Prophets and Kings, page 50. The house is the sanctuary for the family and the closet or the grove the most retired place for individual worship. But the church is the sanctuary for the congregation. There should be rules in regard to the time, the place, and the manner of worshiping. Nothing that is sacred, nothing that pertains to the worship of God, should be treated with carelessness or indifference. In order that men may do their best work in showing forth the praises of God, their associations must be such as will keep the sacred distinct from the common in their minds. Those who have broad ideas, noble thoughts, and aspirations are those who have associations that strengthen all thoughts of divine things. Happy are those who have a sanctuary, be it high or low, in the city or among the rugged mountain caves, in the lowly cabin or in the wilderness. If it is the best they can secure for the Master, He will hallow the place with His presence, and it will be holy unto the Lord of hosts. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, pages 491 and 492. Thursday, November 12. Idolatry in Education There must be no lowering of the standard as to what constitutes true education. It must be raised far above where it now stands. It is not men whom we are to exalt and worship. It is God, the only true and living God, to whom our worship and reverence are due. Evangelism, page 133. The substitution of the precepts of men for the commandments of God has not ceased. Even among Christians are found institutions and usages that have no better foundation than the traditions of the fathers. Such institutions, resting upon mere human authority, have supplanted those of divine appointment. Men cling to their traditions and revere their customs and cherish hatred against those who seek to show them their error. In this day, when we are bidden to call attention to the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, we see the same enmity as was manifested in the days of Christ. Of the remnant people of God it is written, the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. But every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. In place of the authority of the so-called fathers of the church, God bids us accept the word of the eternal Father, the Lord of heaven and earth. Here alone is truth unmixed with error. David said, I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients, because I keep thy precepts. Psalm 119, verses 99 and 100. Let all who accept human authority, the customs of the church, or the traditions of the fathers, take heed to the warning conveyed in the words of Christ. In vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. The Desire of Ages, page 398. By causing men to violate the second commandment, Satan aimed to degrade their conceptions of the divine being. By setting aside the fourth, he would cause them to forget God altogether. God's claim to reverence and worship above the gods of the heathen is based upon the fact that he is the creator and that to him all other beings owe their existence. 
Thus it is presented in the Bible, says the prophet Jeremiah. The Lord is the true God. He is the living God and an everlasting king. The gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. He hath made the earth by his power. He hath established the world by his wisdom and hath stretched out the heavens by his discretion. Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 10 to 12. The Sabbath, as a memorial of God's creative power, points to him as the maker of the heavens and the earth. Hence, it is a constant witness to his existence and a reminder of his greatness, his wisdom, and his love. Had the Sabbath always been sacredly observed, there could never have been an atheist or an idolater. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 336. For further reading, My Life Today, Be Strong and Courageous, page 120, and Our High Calling, One with the Church Above, page 167.